I don't want to, no, I'm not, not going to do it. Is how most developers in 2026 respond to being told that they're going to have to manually manage memory in their code base. That's a long alliteration. Maybe I'll just say MMM from now on. So I dug into manually managing memory. And by that, I mean I read one article and then threw this presentation together in like 10 minutes. And this is what I think about the landscape. So first of all, I tested this hypothesis that nobody likes to manually manage memory and no one can do it these days. And indeed, this slightly doctored poll shows that almost all developers are incapable of doing this manually. Now, there's a bunch of reasons that we don't do it anymore. It's kind of considered this like opaque academic thing, and we have um, really good consumer hardware these days. So the, the consumer chips have so much RAM that we can actually get away with software abstractions that avoid having to call malloc and free. Garbage collection is probably the most famous, but we have a couple of other strategies people have come up with. Uh, but the problem is this leads to really bad software. When there's this attitude like, oh, it's too complicated at the lowest level, I can't learn this, we just get really bloated and terrible software. People just like uh, get weaker and weaker. But sometimes we can't afford on embedded systems or whatever, like an, an older piece of hardware, you can't really afford the memory to have a garbage collector. I mean, most people probably know this. You could not fit the JVM on an Abacus. Even like a really specced out Abacus, like maybe Copernicus's Abacus Pro Max, you could fit the JVM, but you probably couldn't do much more than run a simple web server. Um, there's also this whole perception, and you see this all over computer science and most fields in academia in general, that it's just really hard and complicated to manually manage memory. If you're in university computer science, they probably have a class in C where they're like, Ooh, here's a malloc, here's a free, you're going to call it once or twice just to see how it used to be done, but we don't do that anymore. It's like an archaic, ancient, and very difficult academic exercise. And I kind of think this is an attitude that's like falsely makes manually managing MMM um, difficult. It's like those people who are like, oh, I'm, I'm not good at math. I can't do math. And the reason they can't do math is just because they think they can't. It's like purely uh, like fake psychological barrier constructed to not have to do something when in reality, it's quite a simple problem. Um, so let's do a quick review of the basics in memory management. So most people know about the stack. The stack is just uh, this object that we have built into C. C is the language I'm gonna use as an example. And it's got a couple of keywords that you can use to interact with it, which is an interesting reframing I actually heard where instead of these just being scopes where it's like, oh, you can't use this variable after it, this is actually a way of managing memory. So we have this left osprey and right osprey keywords. Now the uh, left osprey, that's left, right? I'm directionally challenged. Once you put that into C, it'll say, all right, everything from here on out, we're going to put on this osprey. And once you're, once you feel satisfied that the osprey is loaded up with stuff on top of it, then you can close the stack frame after you've done some work. And then all that stuff gets thrown out by the stack. So that's what the stack does. The stack is very fast, uh, but it does have a couple limitations. It's a little bit inflexible um, with memory. And it, yeah, it's, it's kind of a rigid linear kind of thing. Um, you can't really cram big, complicated, unknown size objects onto it. Then there's the heap, which in school they're like, this is a big sand pile. And it's where you put all the blobby, like big chunks of memory you're not really sure uh, the size of. And it, we have these two functions, malloc and free. These are like the canonical ones that they give you. There's a bunch of other ones in most C runtimes, but these are the famous ones. Malloc, uh, hold on, I got to sneeze. Um, malloc, basically, you give it a size, say like two, and then it's like, oh yeah, you can put that over there. And then free, you give it the over there, and then it gets rid of it. Now there's this thing you hear in every video where someone mentions low-level programming. Um, don't shoot yourself in the foot. Oh, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot. And I really hate this because it's like, what does that even mean? Like, why can't you just not do that? Uh, what do they exactly mean by shoot yourself in the foot? You may say, oh, it's, it's simple. It's just when you free something that's already been freed, 
or you, uh, I don't know, you malloc and then you forget to free and then you've got a memory leak. Well, why are those things really bad? And also, like, can't you just not do that? It seems like a pretty simple thing to not do. So I researched this a bit, and there's a bunch of problems that arise when you only have access to the most basic malloc and free in the stack. Um, I think I have slides after this that explain uh, each of these things. Um, so, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll go through it here. This one is, is kind of confusing, so I'll skip into a couple. Um, lifetimes can get really confusing, which is like how long data lives. If you've only got two things, one to malloc and free, you have to kind of keep track of everything you've created and then free it later. Um, and this is a problem when, say, you're in a game loop and you create like, let's say you have a slave game, you know, and the slaves, they have some action they can take, they can build a pyramid or pick cotton or whatever your preferred time and place is and what slaves do um, in that historical context. And then you have a loop and you loop through and you create like 5,000 slave objects. Now you're going to have to free each one of these manually with, uh, with free. And that's really cumbersome and annoying. It's going to take a lot of code. So in situations where you create a lot of things, these two create and free get kind of annoying. So there's a there's a couple of things people had done to fix this. One is tying the the memory management to the creation of the object. You see this a lot in C++. I think this is called resource uh, acquisition is initialization, where um, just creating the object basically does all the mallocking. So you might have a bunch of properties on an object, and then you have like a function that returns an instance and see it, it it handles the malloc itself and then you have like a destructor basically and i think c plus plus will make this automatic and c you'll have to do it manually this is a pretty sane approach to that that problem but it's not perfect because sometimes you have like more complex relationships and you don't want memory allocation actually tied to the object itself um, you want to be able to deallocate all the slaves all at once. You're still going to have to call destruct on all of them, you know, whereas if the memory management were not tied to it, it would be better. Like if you could throw all the slaves in a big bucket, basically, and then throw the whole bucket out at once, that would be a better solution. Um, there's also this whole thing where people are religious about freeing memory. We're probably told in school, a lot of you, that like the worst thing you can possibly do is leak memory, which is where you malloc and then you forget to call free. But that's actually not that bad depending on the context. Like if you're mallocing in a game loop and every frame you're using up a bunch of memory, that'll eventually uh, override everything you have available on your computer. But if you're just mallocing something like on startup, you actually don't really have to free it because modern computers have so much memory. And also, when you close a program, it'll terminate. The operating system will like clean all the memory it used. So it's kind of like the, the operating system's like a garbage collector, actually, when you close down the app. And I used to think that when you... Uh, called malloc and then you close the app if you didn't call free well you're out of luck your memory is like used up for all time you know and then your computer will just slowly grind to a halt that's just ridiculous though um, and when people call free too much it gets really cumbersome if you're calling free for everything you allocate your code base is just going to fill up with unnecessary lines of code even though more lines is in general better it means a better program in this case you don't want that um, I, I already kind of gave this example where you have like a bunch of different objects you're creating in a game and then you, you're going to have to parallelize each free. If you create a thousand objects in a loop, now you're going to have to free all the objects. And um, it's, it's not terrible because you could have another loop and just loop through and free them all, but what if you want to free like one guy in the middle of the loop? Then it's, then it's kind of an annoying problem. Um, so what people tried to do in the past with Java and stuff is they try to op automate the uh, malloc and free process. And how Java handles this in other languages is a garbage collector. And what the garbage collector does is it just every once in a while it checks what stuff is allocated and what stuff is still referenced. And the problem with this is it takes time to do this and it goes in these cycles where every once in a while your, your program will stop 
doing useful instructions and it'll just garbage collect. So it'll like randomly jerkily collect everything. And uh, yeah, that's just not, not the way. Um, so this, this one guy said, the way you can go isn't the real way. I kind of knew this from a young age and that's why I do the things that I do. Uh, but basically what this means, I think, is that sometimes you have to look away from what everyone else is doing. Like, what if, what if you just question, was the garbage collector the correct move all along? Was abstracting on top of Malik and Free actually good? Um, I think there's a, there's a problem in computer science where you will hear something, you'll hear the way something is done, and a lot of the time we just go, yeah, someone way smarter than me a long time ago came up with the best way to do this, and now this is how we do it. But it's a very healthy attitude to question why you do everything at all. Uh, because as you get deeper into your computer science career, especially if it's like some kind of abstract thing at a company, there may be like no good reason or the reasons may have changed. Um, and maybe you should go in a different direction. So instead of building on top of trying to automate the the deal with Malik and Free. What if we go down a level? And um, what does this mean? Oh, back to the back to the stack. Okay, so I guess we're talking about the stack again. It's been a while since I wrote this. So if you think about the stack, right? It's just kind of part of C. It's just built in. We just take it for granted. But that's not actually necessarily the case. You can actually with different compilers. Um, like Clang, for instance, you can pass the uh, F freestanding, fucking freestanding flag. And this says, don't actually ship with the stack or any, any memory management at all. You can actually implement your own version of the stack in the heap. And this seems kind of ridiculous. We take this stuff as like the core inbuilt, lowest level nitty gritty version or a piece of the language. But you can actually make your own memory management structures. Well, let that sink in for a second. You can actually build your own version of the stack or the heap, or you can modify properties about it. So you can go kind of lower level and do stuff on your own. So uh, the stack, um, why, why did I put this stuff about lifetimes here though? I guess the stack, um, it's very primitive. It has this like, okay, we're going to start allocating new memory, right? This is a new frame of the stack with the left Osprey keyword. Everything in here we're going to allocate. And this is also in here actually. Uh, but this is pushing a new frame too. And now everything in this new frame um, is, everything is going to be stored in this new frame. The problem is you can't bleed across previous frames. Uh, so this is what's called a lifetime. This B has like already died. This left Osprey is like, all right, we're done storing all this stuff. So you can't access the B. And there are sometimes in complex scenarios for some reason that I don't really understand because I'm not a very capable developer yet, where you actually want this B to stay alive. I hate when they're like super basic examples in like Java class and they're like making like a car class and they're explaining all this polymorphism and everything. And it's like, well, this is just the dumbest, most simple example. And that's what I feel about this kind of I don't really understand why you'd want to have lifetimes that overlap, but apparently it's something you want to do all the time. So enter the arena, which is basically, um, what if there were multiple stacks? What if we made our own stack and then we just had like hella different stacks? And this is kind of like a big bucket because in that slave example before, what if instead of allocating each of those slaves on the main stack, what if we just created a separate stack and then we throw all the slave objects onto that stack? Why would you do this? Um, well, the main, the main advantage, if you think of a bucket, you can just dump the whole bucket out whenever you want. So it makes it very easy to like store things in groups and then free them all at once. If you store all your objects, all your game objects on the main stack, then you're having to manually um, move through the program. And if you store them all in the heap, then you're having to manually free each one of them. But if you make like a big area where you're like, okay, everything is going in this area, the slaves area. Now we can just free that whole area all at once. And what an arena fundamentally is, is basically a second stack. 
Um, and you can pass, you can parameterize it. So you can pass it around and then, I don't know, you could, it, it, that initialization code I showed earlier where each object like deals with its own memory management, instead of having a malloc and free, you can just pass an arena and then it'll put itself into the arena. And that's, that's honestly a pretty genius invention. This is how Zig, I think, handles all memory management. That's how good it is. And there's a bunch of different properties actually we can tap into. So if you're building your own stack from scratch from the ground up, you can change a bunch of its properties. It doesn't necessarily have to be a stack. A stack is nice because it's like first in, last out, first in, first out. Yeah, that's the other one is a linked list. But there's no reason why you couldn't use a linked list to manage memory or a, uh, a slab arena or there's a bunch of different kinds. Frame Arena is a good example. That that one's used when there's a bunch of data that comes in and out quickly, like in a game loop where you're you're drawing frames, or maybe you want to store the previous frame so you can like do diffs on different things. Um, you can basically make any custom shape a bucket to store things. You can tweak the properties a little bit, and it's worth noting this is all implemented using malloc and free. Um, so you're kind of like storing it on the heap but you can you can add specific properties so you could make each um each like frame you store on the stack a certain size or you can control the order in which they come in and out and it really depends on the implementation this is the kind of thing that game devs do all the time and i, I don't fully understand all the different strategies of allocators i would go read um, some stuff on it instead of just watching this presentation you don't honestly learn a lot from watching YouTube videos, in my opinion. Reading docs is better. So what about what about Rust? Where does it fit into the memory management landscape? Rust is interesting because if you actually look at how it's handled, it uses allocators under the hood. What the borrow checker is, is just like this compile time enforcement on top of that that handles like the ways you're allowed to use the heap. And you can use allocators very effectively in Rust too. It's just like the default mode in which it operates. They add some extra rules on top of uh, on top of the normal. Like C just lets you do whatever you want, and this is like no, you can't do whatever you want with a heap. There are a couple things you can't do. But other than that, allocators are still very valid in Rust. Um, I don't. Okay, what did I do with this pure linear type system? I think this is. This is, oh, Rust uses an affine type system, which is basically uh, every type you create, you can use or not use, but you can't copy it. Uh, you actually can copy it in Rust with some complicated acrobatics. And then a pure linear type system is where once you create a variable, you have to use it exactly once and no more than once and you can't copy it. This is like really weird languages that theoretical mathematicians make in their free time and no one really has to worry about yet. Um, I basically plagiarized most of this from this guy, Rian. I'm not gonna try to pronounce the last name. I know I'll mess it up. Um, you should really go read this article. He goes into much more depth about what allocators actually are. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's memory management as far as I understand it. The most important thing you need to know is allocators and why and how they're used. Basically, the, the gist is they're a second stack that you control the properties of. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I'll see you next time.